All right. Um, so Perfect. we are ready to start, guys. Uh, thank you for joining for our series Behavioral Science Talks. Uh, uh, we have Christina Bettieri with us, who is a professor of philosophy and psychology at the, at the UPenn. She's the director of the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. And her work is on social norm measurement, and she does field experiment on norm change, cooperation, and fairness on social networks. And she's also the author of the book Norms in the Wild. So we're very lucky to have her here today for a new work on uh, COVID around uh, the world. Uh, so, Christina, whenever you're ready, um, you can start. I'm going to just mention that next week uh, on Monday, we are going to have another talk this same time uh, with, um, all right, with Rick Heyman, who is a professor at NYU, and we're going to talk about the science of relationships. I'm going to click, I'm going to paste uh, a link so you guys can register if you're interested. So, Christina, it's all yours. Thank you again for being here with us. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so, um, I want to discuss uh, some very interesting results we got uh, from uh, a research, uh, which uh, I did uh, with uh, two colleagues of mine, but mostly, if you see all the names, uh, most of the people are my students in a class on norm nudging. And uh, we started asking the question, okay, can we uh, nudge people um, during the pandemic uh, to behave uh, in an appropriate way, in a safe way, and to protect themselves and others. And uh, under which condition this will happen, and is it enough for government to send, uh, uh, typically what you do, you send messages. I cannot, I cannot move my, okay. Uh, to send messages about, let me move this, sorry, and this, okay, sorry guys. Okay, send messages about what other people do or what other people approve or disapprove of, and we know norm nudging is based on sending such messages with the idea of creating particular expectations in people. So if I send you a descriptive message saying most people, you know, comply uh, with uh, the government prescriptions uh, about safety and so on and so forth, I will create a new empirical expectation, descriptive expectation, expectation, oh, okay, this is what I expect people to do. And the message, instead the injunctive normative message is a message about what people approve or disapprove of. If I tell you most people approve of staying home, wearing masks and so on and so forth, then I will create a new normative expectation. So expectation uh, about what other people are going to approve or disapprove. Okay, and I will concentrate here on uh, two measures that have been adopted um, sort of consistently by all the countries we analyze, and these are social distancing and staying at home. Now we know that government cannot rely uniquely on coercive power, you know, forcing people, <laughs> police power, um, to stay home and to uh, practice social distance, you know, because uh, uh, first of all, it's very difficult, it's very costly, but uh, you know, uh, government must rely on other things. First of all, on their perceived legitimacy, the authority of their responses, science communication, especially in the case of a pandemic, science communication is obviously very important, appeals, you know, moral, emotional appeals, and also leverage people's cognitive bias to influence their behavior. So there are lots of things that governments, um, you know, can do. Sorry. Now, one driver for compliance may be newly emerging social norms regarding social distancing and staying at home. So this can be an important driver for compliance. And again, norm nudging thinks that this, uh, you know, is indeed, uh, you know, uh, eliciting this social norm or creating this social norm is an important driver for compliance, okay? And so 
Behind that is the idea that empirical and normative expectation about this compliant behavior might influence, in particular will influence, the decision uh, to comply. However, we have also to think of something else, that the decision to comply may be influenced by other factors. And in particular, since these are important messages sent by government, but also by scientists, it is important that we trust these messages, that we believe that uh, these messages are correct and uh, in our interest. And we'll come to that later on. Sorry. Oh my God. Um, so the research question here are mainly two research questions. The first research question is, do empirical and normative expectation that we may create through the messaging we send to people affect their willingness to comply with the, the measure recommended or imposed by the government, social distancing and staying at home. So do these expectations, I call them social expectations because they are expectations about other behavior and beliefs, do they influence us? And the second question is, is this influence moderated by trust in the government and in the scientist or science? So this is a crucial question. So we did a big survey in nine countries. In Asia, we did South Korea and China. In Latin America, we did Mexico and Colombia we did the US and in Europe we did Spain, Italy, UK and Germany. We partner with the NetQuest and XP Lab. We had the participants who are panel members from each of these companies. We have representative sample and people received a flat compensation. So our study, uh, I will show, is divided in various parts. There is a demographic analysis, and I will show you very quickly. Um, there is a survey vignette experiment. We will spend some time on that. There is also self-reported behavior. So uh, did you uh, practice social distance and staying at home before the lockdown, after the lockdown? Um, and also we have, we ask uh, uh, self-reported beliefs of what should be done and self-reported social expectation. And then also, um, finally, we measure trust uh, in people and institution. And the measure of trust is very long, but what matters for this particular study is a measure of trust in scientists and government. And the survey was conducted online in late April, beginning of May. Now, if we look at uh, the demographic, okay, sorry. Uh, we see we collected overall 1,200 responses per country and for every country about half of the respondents identified as women and all had an average age in the 30 and 40 and only in China people were much richer than the median on average. So uh, this is basically our demographics. Now, if we look at the experimental design, what we did is the following. We give people um, a survey experiment with a two by two design where we vary the combination of normative and empirical expectation regarding, again, social distancing is staying at home. So look at the first cell, T1, most, most. People exposed to this vignette, and I will show you in a second the language of the vignette, but will, will basically be exposed to high normative, high empirical expectation. What does it mean? They are exposed to a situation where 
people do believe okay that one most people do believe that one should practice the specific behavior and also most people do practice on the diagonal, you know, look at for the opposite. People who look at this vignette, they see that, uh, you know, a situation where few people believe one should obey, you know, practice uh, this behavior, and few people indeed practice the behavior. And then there are two interesting uh, variations where expectations are incongruent. So either Let's look at T2. Uh, in T2, um, most people believe uh, that one uh, should practice the behavior, but very few people practice it. And uh, in T3, very few people believe one should practice, but most people practice. And these uh, uh, two particular situations are important because uh, there are many studies I did and keep doing studies on incongruence of expectation and in some cases i would say quite a few cases especially of negative behavior we see then that when there is a, a, you know a large number of people that misbehave even if most people say that one should behave you know the incentive to misbehave becomes pretty high now in our case because there are differences between countries, etc., uh, whereas there are not many differences between most, most, and few, few, we concentrate on the most, most, and few, few. Okay? And in this case, our individuals in each country were randomly assigned, randomly assigned to one of these four conditions. Oh my God. Okay. Now, so the responders were presented with a version of the following vignette. Again, it can most, most, few, few, most and few, few and most. And what does a vignette say? Somebody like you live in a very similar country that is affected by COVID-19. And let's say a high expectation would say most residents are practicing social distancing and staying at home apart from an avoidable and necessary trip. And most residents also believe that one should practice social distancing and stay at home apart from unavoidable and necessary treats. And then you're asked, you know, what is the likelihood that this protagonist, this character in the vignette, will practice social distancing and stay at home? So given this situation in which most people do, most people believe, what will the person do? And uh, they have a liquor scale on of going from one to ten one the lowest ten is uh, uh, the highest and i have to say that at the time of uh, this uh, uh, vignette all countries were in lockdown okay and let's move to the next one and these are the very interesting results. Okay, again, the question is how likely is the guy in the vignette to comply on a scale of one to 10? And you see that from low to high, low, low, high, high, compliance with social distance goes up 55% and 56% for staying at home. Okay, and these are the averages that I give you with standard deviation for the pooled data, pooled data for all nine countries. And the baseline for both behavior is just lower than five, you know, low, low for 93, for 88, again, on a 110 scale, okay? And you see that the outcomes of the two behaviors, stay home social distances, are highly correlated, 0.87. And so at the very end, for some slides, I will only focus on social distancing because the results are almost identical. And you see the big difference, uh, you know, between high, high and low, low. Okay, the uh, likelihood of uh, good behavior in the high, high is pretty high and in the low, low is pretty low. So there is 
a consistent response and an influence of expectation on the likelihood of behavior. In the middle cases, is different, is lower, and is different in different countries. So we concentrate on uh, the high and uh, the low. And what we see consistently, so on the y-axis, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the result from uh, the Likert scale on social distances from one to 10. And uh, the orange bar is high expectation and the khaki bar is uh, low expectation. And you see that uh, um, you know, there is a, a huge difference. So people with high expectations in uh, the vignette, okay, uh, the behavior is uh, significantly better. So uh, it tells me that increasing expectations, both empirical and normative, significantly increases the likelihood of compliance uh, with social distancing across country, okay? And if I look at the staying at home story, you know, as we can see, like the previous slides, uh, results for staying at home and social distance are very, very similar, increasing both normative and empirical expectation, increases people assessment of the likelihood of compliance with staying at home measures across countries, okay? So look at the orange bar and the other bar, huge difference, okay? Then we look, at, so in the vignette, the expectations are exogenous. You know, I give you a vignette and I give you, uh, you know, a particular situation where let's say all expectation normative and empirical are very high but I provide the expectations. Now, when we look at self-reported behavior, we look at endogenous expectation, the expectation that people have. And we look here at uh, um, measures about um, behaviors and uh, expectations, but also normative belief. What is a normative belief? Is that uh, personal belief that one has that one should comply with the measures. An empirical expectation about expectation about how many people comply, normative about how many people approve of compliance, think that one should comply before and after the lockdown. And now remember that we did uh, this survey after the lockdown and so people will have a tendency probably to say that, you know, uh, even before the lockdown, they complied quite a bit. Say, majority said they comply. And this is average over countries, and we shall see that compliance varies by country. So, this is an average. Normative beliefs are usually high. And here, there is a, seems to be a mismatch between empirical and normative expectations uh, that are relatively low with respect to the behavior. Um, but we will see when we look at specific countries what uh, what happens and there is also the possibility uh, that uh, um, you know uh, there is a bias there is a demand effect uh, when you ask this thing especially after the lockdown but still the results in the end are very similar now if you look uh, the interesting thing is uh, before the lockdown, three-fourths of our respondents reported practicing the behavior, and almost everyone reported doing so after the lockdown, okay? So if you look at self-reported behavior, normative belief, expectation, they all increase uh, after the lockdown by more than 20 points. But then let's, look, let's look at different countries. And this is beliefs and behavior before the lockdown, and we have China, Colombia, Germany, Italy, Mexico, South Korea, Spain, UK, US. And um, again, um, you know, uh, they uh, declare, <laughs> you know, really uh, good behavior. The problem is when you look at expectation, there are 
significant differences because China and South Korea, okay, we look at high expectation, low expectation is above or below the median for the country, okay? And China, South Korea, even before the lockdown, declared relatively high expectation, both normative and empirical. Spain and the UK were very low, very low. And uh, uh, this is interesting uh, because, uh, um, especially in the UK, if we look at the UK, all uh, the announcements were, you know, uh, don't do much, uh, uh, you know, you don't need to wear masks and so on and so forth uh, uh, until the prime minister got sick. <laughs> uh, if you look at the behavior after the lockdown, you see that uh, uh, all, you know, basically there is a, a big, uh, uh, a big change up. Okay, as, uh, as we see with the aggregate. But interestingly enough, in Mexico, the Mexico's a little bit of an outlier, we will see later on, the empirical and normative expectation increase, but not very much, not very much. And uh, I think uh, there are reasons for that. Now, why we want to compare self-reported behavior with what people say in the vignette experiment. Here we have a robustness check. First of all, we want to know that the vignette results have internal validity. So do we get similar results? And the most important thing is looking at conditionality of behavior. In the vignette, clearly behavior is conditional on social expectation. But is it the case also with self-reported behavior? And the answer is yes. But what did we do? We split particip uh, participant, sorry, into four groups, okay? Uh, by reported expectation before or after the lockdown, using the median again as a cutoff point. And so in particular in what follows, I will focus on high expectation, as I said, remember high means both high normative, high empirical, and low expectation, low normative, uh, low uh, empirical. And expectation are highly correlated, uh, and so we use both compliance variables, Okay, and in each category, in each uh, of the four groups, about, uh, you know, we have one third of uh, uh, participants. Okay, and um, we get very similar result uh, from the vignette when we compare cell reported compliance among high high, it goes up 37%, and uh, uh, cell reported compliance uh, between low low. Okay, so here we look at self-reported self social distancing before the lockdown. And again, we see very similar results to what we saw in the vignette. The orange bar is high expectation, remember, high, high. And uh, the other part, let's say the khaki bar, is low, low expectations, okay? So in the, in the orange case, they believe that most people comply and in the end and think that one should comply, etc. cetera. No, no, very few people comply. Very few people think one should comply, okay? And uh, we have, uh, we show the mean for each country, the mean before the compliance, before lockdown, for, you know, uh, high versus low expectation. And here too, we see that compliance is conditional on expectation. Higher expectation result in higher reported compliance. Now, Mexico is a little bit of an exception, but we've seen that, uh, you know, on average, their expectations uh, are pretty low. And uh, 
we see that we get similar results when we compare okay, behavior after the lockdown. Behavior after the lockdown, again, people, uh, here we have the mean reported compliance, okay, and uh, this is staying at home, sorry. No, I'm very sorry, I am moving this in the wrong way. And this, and this, and this, and this, and this, okay. Okay, so social distancing and self-reporting, staying at home are, uh, you know, um, they report compliance very high with high expectation, much lower with uh, low expectation, apart uh, from Mexico and a little bit Colombia. But Mexico is a little bit of an outlier, okay? So this is very important to notice that the results are robust. The vignette and the self-reported results tell us the same thing. The compliance is conditional on expectations overall. Now, we may ask, what is the mechanism behind the strong connection that we see both in the vignette and in the self-reported behavior between compliance and expectations? And this is an important question, an important policy question, because is creating high expectations through the media, et cetera, not sending conflicting messages, are these expectations sufficient to guarantee a consistent, stable, and high level of compliance? So is it enough to give consistent messages about good behavior. Because behavior in this case, in the case of the pandemic, is costly, okay? And so when behavior is costly, we should also have good reasons, okay? To comply with what is requested of us. And who is giving us good reasons? Whom do we trust? So as we shall see, I preview, trust is a very important component that strengthens the connection between expectation, especially high expectation and uh, compliance. And if we look, sorry, I keep moving this, oh my God. If we look at uh, trusting government as scientists by countries, the first thing we see, trust again, in a, is a, on a scale one to four. One, two is low, and three and four is high. And when we look at the first column, we see that overall, trust in scientists is always greater than trust in government, overall. Even when there is low trust in government, trust in science is a little higher. Now, a big outlier is China, where trust in government and trust in science are both extremely high. Okay. But overall, instead, you see the respondents tend to trust scientists more than government. Okay. The highest average trust in scientists is in Spain. And lo and behold, the lowest trust in scientists is in the US. Very interesting. Highest average trust in government is in Germany and the lowest in Mexico. So Mexico is an outlier for many reasons. Okay, and for many of our analysis, we compare high trust before with low trust uh, one, two. Now let's look at the next slide, which is, which is very interesting. So what happens? So we, we measure trust and we look at people uh, that were given the low expectation vignette. And the low expectation vignette, typically there is uh, 
uh, an expectation, uh, the likelihood of compliance uh, is low. Now, what we see here, we have uh, um, two different bars. The orange bar is people who don't trust science, have a low trust in science, and uh, the khaki bar is high trust in science. And these are all people with low expectations, remember them. And uh, we separate them from those that have low trust in government and people who have high trust in government. And uh, increasing trust in government, we see that increases willingness to comply most in people who have high trust in science. Okay, so we ask how likely is uh, the character in the vignette to comply, but we also measure trust. And so we compare what they say with their trust, both trust in science and trust in government. So we see that uh, with uh, social distances, and uh, we will see also, um, you know, um, the same, we have the same result, exactly the same result uh, with staying at home. So uh, you meet them here, okay? So again, increasing trust in government increases willingness uh, to comply, uh, mostly people who have high trust in science. Okay, now let's look at what happens with people with high expectations. That's very interesting because um, people who, who have high expectations, okay, you see, but, and high trust in science, boom, compliance goes to almost uh, expectation becomes from one to 10 is close to eight. So the likelihood that the character will comply is very, very high. And when both expectations are high, so government and science are high, increasing trust in government, you see, has no important impact. It doesn't really matter. What seems to matter for people who have high expectation is high trust in government really pushes them up. Uh, sorry, high trust in, in science pushes them up significantly. Now, we also did uh, um, an interesting ranking of countries, okay, by uh, their level of trust in science and trust in government. And uh, in what follow, we plot the country average compliance for social distance, because again, they are highly correlated, staying at home in social distance, so we show only one. And the previous results are completely confirmed. When expectations are high, the country level correlation between compliance and trust in science is very strong and positive and weakly negative for trust in government. And so trust in government doesn't matter much when you have high trust in, so in science. When both expectations are low, however, there is a positive correlation between trust in government and therefore compliance and no correlation with trust in science. And let's look at low expectation. You remember, you know, these uh, orange dot uh, represent trust in science and trust in science in the horizontal axis, uh, you know, goes uh, uh, from one to four. And uh, uh, the little square are trust in government and as always trust in science is higher than trust in government. Only China, they are both the same, very, very high. But what you see, is that the compliance, again, here we have low expectations people in all these countries. The compliance of low expectation people is higher in countries where trust in government is high. And trust in science plays a little, uh, sort of very little role, okay? And, uh, Let's look at trust and compliance by country with high expectation. Again, we see that 
the orange little dots that represent trust in science are always you know, higher in trust than the trust in government. But here, you know, uh, when both empirical and normative expectations are high, compliance is higher in countries where trust in science is high, and trust in government basically plays little role. So what we see that if we create one way or another high expectations, we have to accompany this expectation, high expectation of compliance with high trust in science. And this is to me quite obvious because we are in the throat of a pandemic. So if you look at what drives behavior, there are different forces. On the one hand, we see that with high expectation, when, when we believe that people, you know, most people will comply, most people believe that one should comply, people will be more willing to comply. And this is a, a material of social norms, basically. Okay, a social norm is defined by believing that most people comply with the rule of behavior, that most people, uh, you know, think uh, uh, that one should comply, you believe that most people think one, uh, one should comply, and you have a conditional preference for compliance. And both the vignette and uh, um, the self-reported behavior show that there is conditionality. So this is a very important uh, element to drive of behavior. And of course, when expectations are low, the opposite happens. Uh, you are less willing to comply. However, this behavior Complying with this behavior is costly. It's costly, the lockdown is very costly. It's costly not to see friends. It's costly not to go around, not go to the restaurant. Um, even wearing masks apparently is costly for most people. And social distancing also is costly because again, you want to see your friends and be together, etc. And so suppose you have very high expectations that people mostly do comply with these measures. In this case, there is an incentive to free ride because the risk of infection is diminished if people comply. When expectations are low, however, um, you know, you might be more likely to comply provided, again, you don't doubt science, because the risk of infection, if you believe that there is a risk of infection, it's very high. You know, people are going around, not wearing masks, etc., congregating in large groups, etc., etc. So free rider incentives are very high with high expectation and uh, uh, almost null with uh, uh, low expectation. And what about doubting the effectiveness of compliance? Again, this is very important. You have to believe that compliance is effective in preventing you from catching the disease, but also protecting other people. Okay. And if trust is science in high, individual will doubt less. And in theory, will be more likely to comply. So they will be more certain about the effectiveness of compliance and what the pandemic is about. And when trust in science is low, you know, individuals will doubt more, uh, you know, the rationale, the reasons for complying, and so they would be less likely to comply. And all these forces, as we shall see in the next slide, interact sometimes in, um, in a way, sorry, in a way that, uh, you know, is quite damaging. And uh, let's look at self-reported behavior before the lockdown and after the lockdown. And on the y-axis, I have the proportion of the self-reported compliance. So this high one here, uh, high trust in science as expectation, the compliance is over 80%, for example. Okay, so this graph shows that 
more than 80% of people with high expectation and high trust in science are compliers. Okay, looks at that. let's look to the right high expectations. Okay, and uh, but less than 50% of high expectation people comply when they don't trust science. Okay, so high trust in science with high expectation, um, you know, works well, the combination works well, but if you have high expectation and low trust in science, you have an enormous incentive to fail out because people are staying home, the risk of infection is very low, and you don't believe that the risk of infection is that high. So your compliance will be uh, quite low. Now, if we look at uh, the people with low expectation, okay, with low expectation, low or high trust in science does not matter much, okay? With low expectation, we believe that most people are non-compliers, basically. And uh, therefore, in this case, uh, uh, high or low trust in science doesn't matter much because you are surrounded by uh, non-compliers, okay? Now, and the pattern is very similar for people who have, uh, to the right, we measure again high expectation, low expectation, but we look at trust in government, not in science, okay? And uh, the pattern is similar for people that have high trust in government, except that most people with high expectation and low trust in government, high expectation and low trust in government still comply. Okay, so high expectation, high trust in government, um, high compliance, high expectation and lower trust in government, they still comply more than 60%. The interesting thing is the science story to the left. So high expectation and low trust in science, free writing. High expectation and low trust in government, you know, if you think just the trust in government, you know, also government may, may have more harsher measurement and maybe punitive measurement. So uh, trust in government is not uh, that incredibly significant. Now, uh, if we look at uh, the behavior after the lockdown, it's very interesting uh, because everything goes up high and low expectations, you know, uh, go up. But the relationship between high expectation and trust is really even more striking after the lockdown. So people who have high expectation and low trust in science, the small orange bar here, you know, uh, really, do not comply, have an incentive not to comply. Now, low trust, in, low trust in science means that you doubt, basically, that what the scientists say is correct. And if what they say is not correct, is what they say is uh, non-credible, for whatever reason you have, then of course, if you expect people to comply with all the measures, you're free right, okay? The low expectation people instead, after the lockdown, remember that the lockdown was pretty serious, okay? And so after the lockdown, uh, if you still believe that people are really uh, non-compliers, you really think your risk is very high at this point. So there is a change. And uh, you see that also, with uh, low versus high trust in government. Again, uh, with high expectations, uh, you know, high trust in government is better than low trust, but even low trust, I mean, uh, the, the compliance is pretty high. And uh, with low expectation, again, the risk 
is very high. And again, I think after the lockdown, this happens because uh, the, the seriousness seems more uh, apparent, uh, apparent. But if you have high expectation, you know, you can basically free ride uh, without, uh, uh, without, you know, too many problems. And now let's look again at before lockdown and after lockdown and the role of trust in self-reported behavior. And here we see very clean and clear policy relevant results. That is destroying trust in science has a super high cost. Since even those with high expectation will exhibit poor level of compliance, okay? So if we look at high expectation and low science before the lockdown, 47% okay, comply. And we have to look at the difference between low and high science in low and high expectation. This is an inter interesting uh, comparison. And if you look at the high expectation before the lockdown, the relative increase, proportional increase uh, between uh, how many people you know, comply or report compliant before the lockdown and after the lockdown, the difference is 76% more. So trust in science has a huge effect on people with high expectation. With people with low expectation, it has basically no effect. We saw that, even a small negative effect. What about government? Again, with the, uh, low versus high trust in government, people with high expectation, there is an improvement, but not as big as with high trust in government, in, uh, in science, from 65 to 84%. So it's a 29% relatively probabilistic increase. For low expectation, it really doesn't matter much. Now, after the lockdown, we have a huge uh, change in behavior. But for whom? Look at the high expectation people after the lockdown, okay? This table summarizes basically the two previous graphs. The high expectation people with low trust in science, even after the lockdown, they comply very little, 42% comply. Those with high trust in science, 98% comply. So the increase in compliance, increase in trust in science, is enormous, 127%, uh, uh, okay? With always speaking of the high expectation, the compliance increases, increasing trust in government, but not as enormously as a compliance with the, uh, the increase in trust in science. And again, why? Because doubting science combined with high expectation of compliance is an enormous incentive to free ride that people with low expectation don't have. After the lockdown, low trust, high trust in science, there is a very modest increase of 12% and even less with low and high trust in government. So there is a self-reported compliance, which is higher because there is the lockdown, because they see that you know a lot of people are dying, the risk is very high, etc. But the expectations do play a role. With low expectation, perception of risk at the point is very high. With high expectation, the perception of risk is lower because you believe again, uh, you know, that people you know are complying. Most people are complying. I am quite safe. So these uh, these percentages show the massive difference in behavior in people with high expectations that have low and high trust in science. Remember that. And trust in government, again, is related to an increase, but a smaller one, okay, in people with high expectations, 29% versus 36% after the lockdown, okay? People with low expectation, the difference in trust, both in science and government, have small effects on 
self-reported behavior, okay? Very, very important point. Now, if we look, great, at trust and compliance by country, here we plot the average compliance per country, and we observe basically the same pattern at the country level. So the orange is low trust in science, the khaki is high trust in science, okay? And on the right, on the right side, we have low and high trust in government. And uh, what we see that before the lockdown, okay, people with high trust in science and the government are most likely uh, to comply with public health behaviors than those with low trust. However, the difference is much larger between those with high and low trust in science. And for China and South Korea, trust in science uh, does not change things. They have high trust in science, we show that, especially China, and uh, high trust in government. The interesting thing, look at the US. Um, in the US, if you have low trust in science, compliance is incredibly low, okay? Is lower than 30%. And this teaches us an important lesson, and I'm going to repeat it and repeat it again, that is, it is okay to induce high expectations in people through messages about good behavior, what people think is the right thing to do, etc. But if people don't trust science, um, we have a completely different uh, and in a sense unexpected effect. Okay. And uh, we look now at behavior after the lockdown. And here we see, we observe the same pattern at the country level. People with high trust in science and government show almost full compliance, uh, and those with low trust do not. However, again, the difference is much larger between those with high and low trust in science. And look again at countries like Spain, the US, the UK, etc. Uh, this is really, really troubling. Now, China and South Korea are. Uh, a different story. But if you look at uh, the US, even after the lockdown, is really, uh, is really serious. What well, trusting government, uh, you know, helps. Now, what is the message I want to convey here? And the message is that, yes, it's important to increase normative and empirical expectation about behavior related to public health, these will increase compliance. However, however, pay attention to the messages you send, especially the government, etc., uh, about science. Because a government that uh, basically does not rely or doesn't want to rely on uh, good science or place down the recommendation of scientists. I'm now thinking of uh, Bolsonaro, Prime Minister of Brazil, as he was uh, openly uh, in conflict with what the scientists said, and this is very dangerous. And you see it uh, by the number of deaths that, you know, we have. And um, here, you know, we have an example of how destroying trust in science and government, but in particular here, we have a destruction of trust in science. For example, uh, an example is when Trump retweeted a video with very false COVID claims, and uh, one doctor, uh, Dr. Stella Emanuel, um, said that uh, uh, demons call illnesses, and Stella Emanuel is famous as a pediatrician who claims that having sex with demons causes endometriosis. So you can imagine, you know, the president um, touting, okay, 
the ideas of a doctor who clearly is giving non-scientific, really wrong messages. And uh, this is crucial because uh, uh, the government and the scientists have to send a joint compatible message. If you destroy trust uh, in science, what's going to happen is that even if you have created high expectations, these expectations will really uh, not help. Because if people don't trust science, uh, they will have a huge incentive to free ride. Uh, to free ride. So do not uh, make people doubt science. So social norms, uh, sort of emerging social norms regarding social distancing, staying at home, do matter a lot. Don't get me wrong, they do matter a lot. But we must recognize under which condition, when they can be more effective at fostering behavioral change. This is really, really crucial. And uh, messaging regarding public health should both emphasize social norms, good behavior, not giving conflicting messages about behavior, like in Florida, they stay on the beach, but you should stay close at home, consistent, good behavior, but also try to increase trust in science. So the government should not be enemy of science, should be an ally of science. And here, I stop talking and, uh, you know, I want to respond uh, to the discussion. Thank you, Christina. That was very interesting. Um, we have a few questions. So most, I think it's uh, usually until two o'clock. So we'll have whoever is, uh, has been able to stay um, can ask a few questions. I have uh, just a basic question at the beginning. Uh, if you can just um, uh, tell us again about the difference uh, between empirical expectations and normative. Yes. So for everyone, thank you. Yes, uh, very easy. <laughs> Uh, empirical expectation, empirical because they are factual, okay? They are expectation about what other people, of course, similarly, similar to us. Uh, I, I, I usually say people in my reference network, okay, do. So empirical expectation about public health behavior means what do I believe, what do I expect people similarly situate, uh, situated to do about staying home and social distancing in our case, okay? So empirical expectation, our expectation, my belief about what other people, again, similarly situated. I don't care in Pennsylvania or in particular where I live in Swarthmore, what people do let's say, in Colombia, <laughs> okay? I really care about what people around me because the risk increases if I believe that they don't, they don't comply, okay? So these are empirical expectations. Normative expectation, this is a very good question because people often confuse normative belief with normative expectation. Normative belief is what I personally think is the right thing to do, the moral thing to do or prudential, the most prudent thing to do, depends, okay? So I, I may think that staying home is uh, the right thing to do, okay? What are my normative expectations? These are my expectations about what most people, again, in my reference network, in my situation, believe one should do. So it's a second order belief about what other people approve or disapprove of, because if they believe one should do, they approve. They believe one should not do, they disapprove. Now, these two expectations are very important, okay, in uh, determining behavior when they do, because we could have this expectation and say, well, yeah, uh, people comply and uh, people believe one should comply with a certain behavior, but I don't care, okay? But in the case of the social norm, there is a third element that matters, that is 
compliance depends on having this expectation. My preference for compliance is conditional on this expectation. So in a social norm, there are three elements, empirical, normative expectation, and conditional preference. And what I did with the vignette is really show people, you know, in different groups, will, I will show different expectation, very high, very low, mixed, etc. And then I asked them, well, what's the likelihood that this character in the vignette, which is very similar to you, what's the likelihood this guy will comply? And the answer show me whether expectation have a causal effect on compliance, whether having certain expectations is inducing people to comply or not. And the vignette tells us, yes, but we want a robustness check. We want to see, you know, then what people in real life say they, what they do, etc. And the result is quite similar. Okay, so the robustness check was positive. Another question uh, from Barbara Wolfinger. Um, she says, in our current situation, um, the government can be separated in the House and the White House and the government agencies, such as NIH and CDC. Would all these entities considered to be government or are the NIH and CDC considered separately as scientists? Uh, they are considered science. You know, uh, uh, Fauci is a scientist, <laughs> okay? And uh, it is very damaging when uh, you have, uh, let's say, a president, okay, uh, sort of uh, uh, not in line, let's say, with what scientists say. Because uh, especially in the case of public health, with other cases doesn't matter, but the case of public health, it matters a lot, okay? You want, uh, you know, it is costly to behave according, uh, uh, you know, to the recommendation. It's costly. Uh, to hold down at home <laughs> is costly to not go and visit friends, etc. And so you want to be sure that there is a good reason to behave like that. And scientists, uh, trust in science, give us a very good reason. But when trust in science is diminished, then we have a problem. Especially if you believe that well, other people comply. But, you know, what science says is really, you know, uh, not credible. I doubt it. And then there is an incentive to free ride. You have to take that into account. It's very dangerous. So what is dangerous, what I want to say here, it is very dangerous to diminish trust in science. And some governments have done that, unfortunately. A follow-up question, two follow-up questions, actually. One, if the trust in government is low, is that beneficial if they sub try to support the trust in, in science? Or is that actually harmful since it's conflict? You may have, uh, you may have uh, uh, um, as you saw in one of the slides, uh, uh, trust in science is more important, is the most important. Trust in government is important, of course. Uh, okay, but trust in science is crucial. So maybe you don't trust that much the government, but you trust science, well, you will comply more. Okay, because trust in government has many dimensions, as you can imagine. Trust in science is very clear in this case. They tell us what the rate of infection, uh, you know what may cause infection, uh, you know how certain behavior are uh, damaging, dangerous or not, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so this is the most important, uh, uh, the most important variable here. Question from um, Amber Maureen. Why would the low expectation, low science compliance after lockdown be so much higher than high expectation, low science? Uh, the low expectations. Uh, the low expectation, what does it mean to have low expectation? Let you think that the world is populated by non-compliers, okay? Very, very low compliance. Now, the interesting question is, if you believe that, uh, the risk may be very high after the lockdown. Because remember that after the lockdown, people 
uh, you know, were made very, very aware of the risk when the government sort of imposes, requires a, long a lockdown and so on and so forth. And you see that in the self-report of people, people report, you know, a much higher level of compliance and increase, uh, uh, you know, an increase also in expectations. But still, remember low expectation is uh, relating to the median above, high, below, uh, lower, okay, low expectation, the median of your country, of the country. So low expectation may be still, you know, uh, relatively high, not that low. But people with low expectation in general, if I aggregate everything, you know, see themselves at high risk. And so, you know, they, they act basically against that, you know, they will comply more. After the lockdown again, because the lockdown was significant and the lockdown told us, uh, they started telling us that how many people are dying and so on and so forth. So if you believe uh, that fewer people comply, you're at very high risk. Before the lockdown is a different situation, I think, because it was less, much less uh, serious in a sense, or perceived as serious, especially in many countries. In Italy, I can give you an example of Italy. Okay, uh, before the lockdown, we all knew that Bergamo, Brescia, Milan were very affected, but people in Sicily or Southern Italy, you know, went on with their normal life, were not really uh, very affected. When the lockdown was put in place, then, it, you know, it, it came to their mind that this is really dangerous. So there is a difference before and after the lockdown. <laughs> I'm gonna ask a, a last question here. Uh, one question is, uh, I'm gonna combine it. Uh, the one is for the, if, if there is any um, mechanisms for increasing trust in science that you can recommend. And then what are the, the best communication channels uh, for this to be most effective? Um, what we see, especially during a pandemic, uh, you know, we see messages on television, from newspapers, etc., etc. And the first thing that I recommend is consistency between what the scientists say and what the government said, the president, the prime minister, etc. Because in all these countries, the presence of the president in America um, or the prime minister in other countries, these are the important, uh, the important people in, the, in these countries, you know, is very important. People tend to believe what, uh, uh, you know, these people say. And if what they say is clearly in conflict with what scientists say, we have a problem. We have a serious problem because if it is in conflict, it may diminish trust in science. People may say, but if the president says so, you know, maybe scientists, uh, you know, are not, uh, are not that sure. And uh, you must also realize one thing, that science uh, is never the truth, <laughs> okay? <laughs> science, uh, science is always tentative, especially with uh, a new virus okay, a new disease, and uh, science, uh, you know, is telling us uh, from month to month uh, of new discoveries, uh, what they know about this, what they know about that, etc. And uh, if you have, uh, again, uh, a trust in, uh, let's say, in the president or the prime minister that says, you know, is, is just a virus like any others, it's like a flu, Bolsonaro, and, uh, and the scientists say, no, no, this is really, <laughs> this is really dangerous. And then we have a conflict. And uh, since science, again, never says it is X, Y, Z with certainty, <laughs> okay? Um, science goes, uh, you know, by trial and error, that's science. And uh, therefore people may, uh, if the conflicting information is there, may start out in science. And that's what we see in the US. I mean, uh, in the US, uh, trust in science is not very high. At the moment, I mean, we're looking at the moment. We don't look, we have a little, you know, uh, shot 
at a, spe a particular period in time, but trust in science is not high. That's a problem. And we receive uh, real conflicting messages. So uh, you can imagine. Um, Christina, thank you so much. Um, that was really insightful. And thank you so much for sharing all this new evidence with us. Um, I'm going to um, pass it on to Stuart, who is the, the president of the Harvard Club of Merrick, Mac Merrick Mac Valley. I'm representing the Harvard Decision Science Lab and the Harvard Kennedy School Alumni Association in New England. Uh, so Stuart, if you want to say hello to your members. Well, I just want to thank them for participating. Again, uh, I greatly enjoy these talks that we're able to arrange. Thank you very much, Christina. Very enlightening. I hope we can figure out how to uh, increase trust in science because clearly we need to do it. I think it's more than a nudge, however. I think we got it. Yes. It, uh, it's yes. a full on remove the sludge. Uh, maybe in November we will. But uh, other than that, please, uh, for all the members from Harvard Club Merrimack Valley and our guests from Harvard Club of North Shore and Harvard Club in Concord, Watch your inboxes. Uh, we'll be putting out an announcement for the talks coming up in the next couple of weeks. And then just put a uh, save the date on September 17th for the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. Uh, we're going to do something that, that evening. We're not sure what, but uh, we're going to enjoy the Ig Nobels. So, Back to you, Alki. All right, thanks, Stuart. Uh, I've uh, pasted a link for you guys to register for the next talk on the science of relationships as well. Uh, thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. And uh, goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay.